reason for why some things manifest themselves as compelling and some things don't. Binswanger would say that you come equipped with an it's like it's a Kantian idea with an a priori ontological structure and that's imagine you're reading a book so then you might say and the book obviously has meaning you're reading it and you're you're into it you might ask yourself where is the book and you could say well the book is the physical object that I have in my hand I mean that's that's what people act like in some sense or at least that's what they say they act like the book is the physical object but then person A might read the book and say I thought that was a terrible book and person B might read that book and say I thought that was a great book and person A and B might differ on how they responded to the characters and they're going to differ in terms of how they imagine the situation and like there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in exactly what constitutes the book and so you'd say well the book is an artifact and the artifact is produced by the, the author but of course it's not just produced by the author because it's produced inside a cultural context that shaped the author and that shaped you and then you bring something to bear on the book which is the sum total of your individual knowledge and your enculturated knowledge and so what that means is that it's almost as if there's a pattern that constitutes you and there's a pattern that constitutes the book and when you put the, the two of them together you get a juxtaposition of the two patterns and it's the juxtaposition that's the book and it's, it's the realization of it this in some part that's led to the oddities of postmodernism and, and to the claim that there's no canonical meaning to any given text because it's a matter of interpretation it's like, yeah, well, just because it's a matter of interpretation and even maybe just because the interpretations are very wide in potential scope that doesn't mean that the text doesn't have any meaning but you can understand how that idea might have come about now for Binswanger the reason the book would be meaningful, at least in part, is because you're imposing something on it and so that would be your individuality Boss would say the opposite. He would say, well, no, the book itself is manifesting it, its meaning to you in some sense of its own accord. And, th and that's because Boss doesn't necessarily make a distinction between the thing, the book, and the entire context within which it's embedded. And he would consider the meaning emerging as a consequence of that entire context. You can't separate the book out from the situation in which it's embedded. Here's a map that I made a while back that helped me understand this, at least to some degree. The phenomenologists talk about three elements of, of being, of Dasein. One is the Umwelt, the other, another is the Mitwelt, and the third is the Eigenwelt. And there are various ways to conceptualize these, and I can give you a couple now. The Umwelt is the natural world, so when we say nature, that's what we mean. We say, well, human beings live in nature. We have a natural environment. So the idea that there's a natural environment is like a canonical idea. And, and you know, we, we even think of the natural environment sometimes as the unspoiled natural environment. As if there are natural environments that exist in the complete absence of human endeavor. And then we also have a social world, and the social world is the world of culture. So there's nature and culture, and that's umwelt and mitwelt. And then finally, other than that, there's the world of the self, which is the part of being, your being, that's only accessible to you. So it's you in, in the middle of culture, in the middle of nature. And so those are the elements of Dasein. And for Binswanger, it's the Mitwelt that contains most of the meaning, or at least that structures the meaning. So if you're reading a great novel, the degree to which you can extract meaning 
from it is a consequence of your previous education and your own enculturation but that isn't necessarily the only way to look at things like if you walk into a bookstore say and a book catches your eye you might say that that book caught my eye well you think what exactly does that mean well it means that out of all the innumerable entities in the bookstore that could have caught your eye only that one did and then you might ask why well the boss would say well the world is disclosing a particular meaning to you why well that has something to do with the way that you're playing out your individual destiny let me show you this first so this is both a constructivist and a phenomenological perspective and so here's the idea that the thing that's at the center of reality is the domain that's not yet mapped so, you're in a relationship, the relationship is betrayed. Before you're betrayed, you're in one place, and after you're betrayed, you're in another place. Before you're betrayed, your world is all structured, and you know where you are and what you're doing and who you're with and what everything is. The second after you're betrayed, none of that's true. And so, the second after you're betrayed, nothing is structured. It's like everything reverts to, to a chaotic place. And so, in some sense, the only time that you encounter a pure view of what the world itself is made out of, what the ground of being is, is when you encounter an error that's so overwhelming that your current framework of meaning is no longer applicable. So, the framework blows apart, but it isn't as if nothing happens when the framework blows apart. Like, if you're in a committed relationship and, and you find security in that and you believe that the security is genuine and that blows apart, then everything that you presumed is wrong. That's your mid-wealth. But when that disappears, there's something underneath it. And what's underneath it, that's the, that's the ground of reality. And the ground of reality is what you explore to put yourself back together and to put the world back together. So you're betrayed and you fall into a depression and you're anxious. But, you know, there's always the possibility of a new relationship that beckons and perhaps your previous relationship wasn't perfect. So the chaos that you fall into is depressing and anxiety provoking. So it generates a lot of negative emotion. But sort of lurking behind that are the sort of dim remnants of hope. And then, as you proceed forward with your grief and your misery, and you're attempting to reconstruct a stable mode of being, you take out of that thing that's anomalous, you, and the world. So another way of thinking about this is that, for the phenomenologists, and this is where they're similar to the constructivists, the ground of reality isn't so much matter as it is information and when you're, when you're living in, in your constructed world and things are going the way that you want them to go then you've constrained that information in a particular way constrained and narrowed it in a particular way that serves your particular narrow end and that, that makes things much more comfortable because then you don't have to deal with the, the information that constitutes the entire world you can remove most of it and say, well, all that's relevant to me, all that necessarily makes up my world of being, are these circumscribed, is this circumscribed set of phenomena. And that works well when it's working, but when it doesn't work and it blows apart, that puts you somewhere else.